Are you ready? You guys are fabulous. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Sure. So welcome everybody after that lovely intro um, to the Wednesday night Sangha, which is the well of being and it's just a wonderful um, group and I will just make a quick announcement starting this. So this Saturday, Sunday, Sunday from nine to 12 is a really cool, um, actually Eve related event, but Eve won't be there. So there's gonna be a queer CEB group. So CEB is Cultivating Emotional Balance. It's a modality that Eve teaches um, that she sort of is generally generationally attached to via her father, but also from Alan Wallace, who's one of Chandra's root teachers, and then the Dalai Lama. Very cool. All I can just say is like super cool training around emotions, understanding your emotions, mapping your emotions, um, and like applying compassion and mindfulness to the whole emotional world that we are enveloped in 24 seven, but right now might feel extreme for some of us. And many of you have met Tig O'Malley, who comes sometimes to actually Wednesday um, night, um, a good friend of Eve's and just a wonderful, extraordinary, compassionate and grounded human being. So he's going to be teaching the series and he's generously letting me assist him. So um, we're having an introductory session on Sunday from 9 to 12, and then you can sign up for the series, which starts towards the end of September, at the end of September and runs for six weeks. Um, so that, and then just check out the whole regular extensive um, SFDC calendar. I believe this Saturday is the Psychedelic Sangha, Sangha an unusual offering that happens once a month. Um, and Noam is putting um, links in the, in the box around events. And then also, are you giving the Donna talk? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he's also throwing the Donna link in there. I like to think of the, I'm not in love, honestly, with that word, Donna, for the contributions, even though it is true. It is an act of generosity to share your hard-earned dollars. I like to think of it more as like an interdependent co-arising thing that we all do because through our voluntary contributions, we all collectively contribute to help or to like create the San Francisco Dharma Collective or really whatever we put our time and energy and money into is what we create. And I'm personally really excited that we're all continually arising together here on Wednesday night through particularly our monetary contributions and then all of the time and energy that we also, it, I don't know about expend, I feel like the time and energy comes back to me personally. So thank you for that. Um, and the, the link is in the chat if you wanna just, avail yourself to that and it's also on the web page under the donation link um, and we really appreciate being able to support the collective and then also being able to support the teachings and our teachers who bring them to us who are now going to share what they have about the lojong thank you <clears throat> i would say that's close to seamless as we can get um, I will continue with a, a tiny bit more um, of us easing in here together. Many familiar faces this evening and so delighted to see you all. Um, it's, if it is your very first night, you are already a member of the San Francisco Dharma Collective. So this idea that when we come together, we create <clears throat> community. And that's such a wonderful and beautiful thing. And as we all know, to hold something beautiful, we need a strong container so that we know it can be held preciously. And so some of the suggestions we have for coming together here in community really draw upon spiritual qualities that are always important to reflect upon. And one of them already has been highlighted of generosity. And in this case, it's a, a different kind of generosity, but the generosity of showing up with your full presence and attention really hard to do these days since almost everything we're doing is on the screen. The temptations to not give yourself the generosity of showing up are very high. So I invite you to really show up here fully and present for yourself and for others and do whatever is needed in order to make that happen. Turn off notifications or you know, maybe if there's a door to close, close the door and give yourself that generosity of being here and give that generosity to each of us as well. I also invite you to engage in the most radical form 
of non-harming you could imagine possible. How tender, how compassionate could you be to yourself and to others tonight? That's the discipline, the discipline of watching our body, our speech, our mind, and noticing if there's ways that we can really show up to ourselves and, and generate this quality of compassion. I think though we often consider uh, wisdom and compassion as these separate wings of the bird, I, I really think that it's our, our compassion and wisdom together that allows us to be in community. So when we're considering that of reaching out and sharing our thoughts, hearts, and minds tonight to really keep it really at the forefront of our mind. Um, as was also uh, foreshadowed, patience. We're in this time here together in which um, it's, uh, I mean, it's always unsatisfactory, such as the nature of samsara, but I think we're at like exceptional unsatisfactoriness, most of us these days. So really exercising your patience as we come here together as part of, uh, part of, our, part of our collective agreements and joyful enthusiasm. Um, that is a part that I think the San Francisco Dharma Collective possibly excels in. Um, I really feel it from you all when I'm here and I feel it myself um, getting to show up and share with you all that we get these teachings, we get to practice them together. They are so useful. I really don't know what we would do without them, truly, on a day-to-day -day basis. So with that, I, um, I'm Eve Ekman uh, at the Well of Being with my most precious Dharma sister, Chandra Easton, who I will now turn it over to. Thank you. Such a pleasure to be with you all tonight and it's such a treat to be with Eve. We haven't taught together in a while. I'm Mopin Chandra Easton and I'm zooming in from Berkeley, um, sitting on Ohlone land and honoring the ancestors and the native uh, tribes who lived here before. And in that spirit of interdependence, it's nice to all take a moment to contemplate where we sit, where we stand, where we live, and to acknowledge what has been before, and to honor that, and to realize that we all are sharing in one way or another through this collective healing through contemplative practice and prayer and through honoring our own container here. It's such a wonderful way to start. This, these qualities that Eve spoke of help us to, to I don't want to say make things right, but how to re-enter the beauty way, you could say. And um, we've been gifted these teachings and invited to share them. And so with uh, humility, I'm sharing with you this practice associated with Lojong, and also tonight we will start with the shamatha practice now. So let's go ahead and make ourselves comfortable and settle in and uh, rest in a position that you feel you can hold in relative stillness with ease and comfort without strain for about 24 minutes. We'll do a gatika. Agatika is the Sanskrit word that uh, refers to a 24-minute cycle of time found in the ancient text called the Kala Chakra, the, the Wheel of Time, Tantra or text. And so it's a nice period of time to sit because it's said to be one complete cycle of prana through the body. So there's a feeling of ease and completeness, not too long, not too short. So find a comfortable position and then really take a moment to settle into a, a place that you feel that you could hold in relative stillness and comfort. And allow the eyes to close to begin as a way to turn inwards from the active day that pulls us out in so many directions, spread thin, spread in many different directions. So feel yourself turning back in and reconsolidating your prana, reconsolidating your attention, your resources. We manifest out in the world and then we have to take a rest. Manifest and take a rest. So here's your rest. 
You've earned it. So let yourself fully drop in. And we'll spend some time with the breath here to begin. Some nice natural belly breaths, feeling the belly expand with the in-breath, release with the out-breath. If you like, you can take some intentional deep breaths. Releasing tension with an outward sigh, if you wish even making a sound, letting go. Feel the jaw slacken, the muscles of the face relax. The shoulders soften, just any extra effort is just releasing, no need to hold or tense up. Feel as if the tension in the body, in the mind, were melting down into the earth beneath you with, with each out-breath. Pavlovian response, the body uh, releases and welcomes this bell invitation to enter into this contemplative mode, just attending now to a natural flow of the in and the out breath, release any control. And let's practice for a bit of just being present with the breath, whether it's short or shallow, long or deep. Just present in the body, in the moment, with the breath rising and falling, free of tension, free of control. simple presence of being in the moment. If you notice that you're chasing after thought into the past or future or even present thought, release that activity of the mind with the out-breath and come back to rest in the body with the breath, the subtle sensations of the flow of the breath as it enters, abides, and leaves the body. natural activity of the mind is to think and daydream and ruminate. It's okay, it's not a problem. Just as soon as you notice, all you need to do is just release, release, release. Relax and then return to the flow of the breath in and out of the body.
notice if there's tension building again in the face, the jaw, the eyes, soften with the out breath. Feel the shoulders melting away from the ears like an old coat on a hanger. The belly soft and receptive to a gentle breath like a sleeping baby. Even with this simple practice of breath awareness or shamatha, calm abiding, with the breath as our anchor, always allow yourself to be imbued with the quality of spaciousness. As you feel constricted or tight or closed down or controlling, release any of that with the out breath and feel a quality of space permeating your body your mind and release any tension with the out breath. That breathing takes place within the space of the body. Feel as if you've never known the breath like this before. Attend to it with more interest, more love, more attention. And drink it in, releasing it out. The two main pitfalls to be aware of for shamatha is laxity on the one hand where you sink and get dull, drift off, sleepiness takes over. If you notice this happening in the meditation, then refresh your attention. Take a deep breath, brighten the inner atmosphere, sit up a little more straight. If you need to, you could open the eyes. Allow some light in and return to the flow of the breath, relaxed and spacious yet clear and lucid. On the other hand, the other pitfall for shamatha is that of excitation, rumination, 
distraction. And if this arises, if you notice this, then the instruction is to relax and release that grasping, that tension. Release and return to the breath in the body with a quality of ease. and relaxation. From time to time, checking in. If you veered off into one of those pitfalls, then just gently bring yourself back with ease, with comfort, with compassion. Stay with the breath in the body. Nourish yourself with this attention, this refreshment of the breath. foundation of relaxation and stability and clarity through the practice of breath awareness. Now we will shift, take another step into shamatha and shift into settling the mind in its natural state where we transfer our primary attention from the breath to that of the space of the mind. And whatever arises within it becomes the object of awareness. So now gently open the eyes if they were closed. Gaze at a comfortable downward angle. And then soften the gaze. Let the gaze be vacant. Feel as if you were gazing into the space itself between you and the floor or the wall. Soften the eyes, don't stare at anything in particular, and feel free to blink from time to time if you're not used to meditating with the eyes open. It's okay to close the eyes and rest them and then gently open again when you're ready. Relaxing the muscles behind and around the eyes, relaxing the brow, the jaw, Now subtle awareness is still with the breath as it rises and falls within the body. Your attention shifts to the domain of the mind itself, that space within which thoughts and feelings, impressions, memories arise, abide and then pass away. And with this practice, we don't prefer clarity or non-thought as opposed to thought. We're actually just simply observing whatever arises within the space of the mind without preference, without rejection. We're clear, we're present, awake, yet relaxed and spacious. as if you're leaning back 
like the back seat of a beautiful theater. And the stage is that arena of the mind. And thoughts are the players that come and go. Some are more dramatic than others. Some are more believable than others. We just lean back and watch, unattached, awake and present with it. But defusing from identity with grasping onto the thoughts and appearances that arise within the mind. Developing this quality of metacognition where we're no longer slaves or enslaved by the mind, no longer fused with all the thoughts and appearances that arise. Release and open. And allow the mind to settle in its natural state, limpid, clear, lucid, and spacious. feeling dull, then brighten, enliven the atmosphere. If you're scattered and busy thinking, ruminating, then relax and release. And return to the space of the mind. This divine tragic comedy Repetitive spiraling of thoughts. Sit back and relax and defuse yourself from all of that mental activity and observe and rest in your natural state, free of grasping, free of distraction.
this practice of settling the mind in its natural state, we're cultivating spacious awareness, not spacey awareness. So if you're drifting back and out, focus, take a deep breath, clarify your attention, release the subtle grasping of distraction with the out-breath, and come back to the present moment. Observing the space of the mind and whatever arises within that space. Observe it and release. Not fusing, just observing. And rather than attending to all the details of the thoughts themselves, you're softening back, broadening awareness, resting from the vantage point of awareness rather than the vantage point of thought. That is the natural state of the mind. Mind itself, sem ni. Mind itself is your, o- your own luminous clarity. It is rigpa, pristine awareness. Release and settle and taste your own Buddha nature. This natural state is none other than that. It's always present. It's so pervasive, we don't even notice it. Allow yourself to soak in it, like you're soaking in the vast, warm ocean of awareness. Permeate every cell of your being with that experience. without losing that quality of clarity of mind, presence. Resting here, you realize that compassion The loving heart is forever effulgent from this state. The compassion doesn't have to be cultivated, it's always present. The nature of the mind is this endless compassionate effulgence. Feel that love. Thank you. As you're ready, we'll slowly come back to the Zoom room. 
And as we come back, let's try to maintain this quality that we cultivated. Uh, we don't have to drop it now. Actually, that slogan we studied earlier, be a child of illusion, illusion is this. It's this remembering as we move into our activities of our day, our night, to rest in that spacious quality of mind. Life is more fun when we can do that. Okay, so we thought it'd be nice to allow a little bit of time if there's any child of illusion questions that want to come through. <laughs> Uh, really pertaining to practice what we just did because we'd also like to spend some time discussing the very rich next slogan and then practice again with Eve. So a little bit here, if there's any little strands of um, question, um, reflection you'd like from us, please feel free to chat that. The chat function should be open so people can chat in their question. I don't know if Pamela needs to do that or not. It looks like it's already open. The chat function's open, and then I also made it if people want to unmute themselves. I, I don't know what you guys think about that, but that's an option. If people that. Yeah, I guess the unmuting is fine. Just try to keep it concise, you know, like we just want to respect time and love to hear your voices, of course. Either way is fine, chat or voice. Uh. <clears throat> I'd like to know what is the point of keeping your eyes open because if you're aware, even if you have your eyes closed, what is the point? I, I find it really hard because I need to blink and my eyes start burning and then I feel tension and even though my mind was pretty clear and I wasn't having that many distractions, but I was feeling the tensions because of the effort of trying to keep the eyes open. Good question. Maybe I'll take this one. Eve, you can maybe take the next one. Huh? Yeah, sometimes when I'm meditating, uh, maybe there's an irritant in the environment and it's just kind of insurmountable. I, I give myself and you all permission to close your eyes. Um, does that always happen, Claudia, or was it just this time, the irritation? Yeah. Um, do you, have you tried taking off your glasses? I don't know if that would make a big difference. Generally, the instruction is to do that. But. I have them off, and okay. actually what I noticed is I was lying down, and if I was trying to keep the gaze down, that was worse than if I just opened my eyes like wide open. Mm -hmm. And then I was just looking at the, at the ceiling, and that helped. But usually, I mean, it's really a tension for me. It's really okay. an effort I, I have really hard time keeping okay. the eyes open. I'm glad you're playing with the positioning and if you do feel access with the eyes wider open, that is great. That's actually, you could say, not more advanced, but it, it's more of a Dzogchen, kind of more of a, an advanced, I guess you could say, style of practice where you actually raise the gaze and slightly look above the horizon. It's called sky gazing. Usually you gaze into space if you have a view of the sky. It's a, a wonderful practice. And I always felt that this practice of settling the mind in its natural state where we gaze downward but we're still open is a wonderful uh, introduction. It gets us used to meditating with the eyes open. But having said that, if you have a particular situation where you're just repetitively tried and it's irritating and it's distracting, then go ahead and close the eyes. I don't know if it would help to put a little you know, homeopathic eye remedy in there before. I had to do that for a while and then it was fine. I didn't have to do that anymore. But if you need to close your eyes, please close your eyes. That's fine, Claudia. Um, you know, just continue with the instruction, but with the eyes closed. Or you could even just close them to the bare minimum where you can still have a little bit of light shining through. If that's not strenuous, that's another way. So why, she asks. Okay, let me see if I can answer this quickly. <laughs> um, some, you know, it's, it's actually noted that um, the Buddha never actually taught to meditate with the eyes closed. That in the suttas, the early words of the Buddha, it doesn't say to close the eyes. The classic meditation posture is to um, lower the gaze just past the level of the nose and gaze downward. 
the closing the eyes came later as Dharma moved around the world and Burma and Thailand and uh, those countries. So it's not to say one's better than the other. I think most people who get introduced to Vipassana first think that closing the eyes is the only way. So I'm just trying to open some minds there about that if, if you were closed about it earlier. The other kind of more um, direct answer also in terms of the why would be that it helps us see and feel and cultivate the understanding that meditation doesn't only happen when we're quiet on a cushion with the eyes closed. That the, ultimately the practice is to blend the meditative state with the post-meditative state and to be meditating now, now, when you're doing the dishes, when you're driving. Well, you know, clarity. <laughs> that wakefulness, that quality of wakeful presence. And then it also helps, meditating with the eyes open also helps to dissolve the illusion that we only exist in here, behind the eyes, in the head. That actually our awareness is all pervasive within the body, but then also maybe it even, there's a little, maybe there's, maybe, I'm actually, I actually, my head, my mind is actually like this big. <laughs> it helps us to understand the interrelated co-arising phenomenal perception, the shunyata of all appearances as well, and to integrate the, wit, the, the insights that come to meditation, through meditation, into our daily life. So it's good to try, but if it's distracting and really uncomfortable, um, try different remedies and try with the glasses on or off. Lying down, open the eyes more if you need to. Even sitting up and opening, looking up at the horizon, you could try that. Just above the horizon, try it. And if it's not for you, that's okay too. You can still settle the mind in its natural state without having the eyes open. Just still really maintain that feeling of gazing into the space of the mind itself. With the eyes open, it helps facilitate that, but you can also work it with the eyes closed. Thank you, Claudia. Maybe another one? Thank you. You're welcome. Some nice commentary from folks, Claudia, just supporting you and giving you some ideas. Um, so different ways. Also, I will mention, maybe you can see this. It's called the mind fold. So you put it on during practice, but it has enough space so you can have your eyes open. Um, so you could maybe train a little bit where it's a little darker um, as well. I also just wanted to say that in the beginning, my eyes hurt too, and they would agitate, they would move. And uh, my teacher said that's normal. It just takes a while for the muscles around the eyes to get used to it, and then they soften. And so that took a couple months for me, and then now it's not a problem. Mm. Well, Chandra, maybe we'll move on to the slogan, <clears throat> to, the, uh, to, the, to the tempe of our evening, as opposed to the meat of our evening. <laughs> uh, I want to thank you for that practice. It was so nourishing. I really felt um, ushered through that focus on my breath and to a place where I could really um, see and notice the activity of the mind, the feel the stillness in the motion. So... Yeah, that was lovely. Um, so this evening, <clears throat> the practice that we're going, to, or sorry, the slogan that we're going to be working with is slogan number eight. I will read it here for you first. Um, and actually, I'll put it in the chat. Why not? So that we can all be looking at it together. So you may recall that um, there are these 59 slogans, but they actually fall under um, seven different points. And just to remind you that we are actually currently still working with relative bodhicitta as kind of the umbrella. And when we think of relative bodhicitta, we think of how do we work that beautiful aspiration of the awakened heart here and now every day. But not the ultimate bodhicitta, which is far greater and more encompassing. 
in some ways this ideal aspirational aspect of our bodhicitta. With the relative, we get to try it out right here and now, moment to moment and throughout our day. In reviewing the slogan before tonight, I really just so deeply felt its relevance and importance. It just is such a handy tool to keep in mind. So <clears throat> it may seem a, a little bit abstract at first, but I think I can very simply explain the pith description of it. Um, Chandra will then also illuminate these words a bit further. And then we will do what is um, so important with these slogans is we will apply it. <clears throat> we will use our first person introspection and see what it's like in meditation in our laboratory to apply these ideas. So three objects, three poisons, three roots of virtue. So we think of these three objects, our friends, our enemies, our neutrals, and the way that we can respond to those really represent some of these three poisons, these kleshas, these just difficult or disturbing emotions, these emotions that occlude that Buddha nature that Chandra was pointing out to us that we can find or reveal right here and now. And these poisons, as may be very familiar to you all, is craving, aversion, indifference, sometimes uh, ignorance is also included in that list um, instead of indifference. And let's just, you know, for a moment, think about these three objects. So with our friend, with our beloved, with someone we see, um, let's say, pop up in the Zoom room, we naturally have this tendency towards, oh, I like that person. I want to be close to them. Oh, can everybody else disappear from Zoom so we can just have a conversation? Um, and there's nothing wrong with enjoying and, and, and feeling care for someone. But what we look out for here, what we want to kind of stay aware and mindful of is how that can create craving. This feeling of, well, I just want that person. Wait, why is that person talking? I only like it when that person talks. And so we're really looking right at that aspect of when we start to apply a preference, right as we are labeling our world. Because this world is, is just as it is, right? It's through our, our labeling, our applying our preference onto it that we create the misery. <laughs> so can we look right at that object of, oh, I like that person, and the craving right with it. And in that moment, turn that craving into a virtue. By wishing, just truly having the aspiration, may I be free from this craving. May everyone who has craving be free from the suffering it creates. So it's as though in the moment of that experience, you recognize that tendency towards what creates suffering and you turn it into a virtue. So some of you already familiar with the Lojong, you know that this is a very um, kind of rich thread throughout these trainings. How do we turn towards what's hard and transform it completely into actually what is not only good, but what is our teacher, what is our instructor? And so we see that same theme here. Then we can imagine this, um, this neutral person, right? Someone, let's say, on the Zoom screen right now, and you're like, yeah, I don't know, it's just their name. I actually, there's not even a face or anything. It's whatever. It's just words. I feel nothing. I feel indifference towards them. And you may see, you may think, well, yeah, that's okay. How is that harmful? How might that lead to my suffering? And when we don't have that heart of compassion, when we feel nothing, a lot of harm can happen. It's not enough to feel care for those we know or feel care for those we care for. I think we're seeing that uh, as a country and as a world, that this interdependence, the people that we don't consider, the people we don't think of, their well being also should exist in our heart. So, can we, in that moment of recognizing neutrality, again, make it a virtue. Wow, may I be free of this indifference. May I be free of this, what we could even call ignorance, to not care, to not know enough to care. And then the enemy, 
the so-called enemy, <laughs> the person that we have attributed or labeled as don't like, don't like, problem, this is the problem. Without this, things would be good. Just get rid of that thing, it'll be good. And what do we feel towards that? Of course, aversion. And right, that's less subtle. Most of us can easily identify myriad aversions <laughs> that we can experience throughout our day. And, you know, the pain of that. Oh, it's so like, imagine someone showing up at the Zoom call who you don't like. Maybe you try to adjust your gallery view and put them to the side, right? Just, oh yeah, let's, put, let's make sure Chandra's in the center and Eve is there. Everyone else I don't want to see. Just the contraction of aversion, just the pain of that. And again, can we kind of in that moment wish ourselves and wish everyone to be free from that painful experience? And in fact, almost taking upon wishing that our ability to transform that could transform it for everyone. Very much in the same vein of the Tonglen practice. It's still in this relative bodhicitta. There is a, a beautiful quote from a teacher that Chandra and I uh, share, Alan Wallace, whose name came up earlier. And he says, as we engage in the affairs of daily life, as soon as we become aware of that attachment or craving or clinging, right then is the time to recognize that there are an immeasurable number of sentient beings who are subject to the same mental afflictions. Expand your awareness of this right on the spot and let the aspiration arise. May those countless sentient beings endowed with the root of virtue that is freedom from attachment. May they be free of this attachment that I am now experience. This aspiration itself is the root of virtue. It's beautiful. And we do the same, whether it's craving and clinging, whether it's the indifference or the aversion. And it, I'm saying this in a very um, calm way, but this is so hard. This is so hard. When especially, uh, I'll just speak for myself, with aversion. If there is a, a being who I have aversion towards, and they are in the same sphere as me, whether it's a Zoom room or an actual room, even on the street, it's as though my entire body biologically is just retaliating. Whether that's kind of, for me, I experience a lot of heat and contraction. So working with this in the moment, it might be just that it's the words, right? First step, recognizing, wow, I'm in this aversion state towards this being. This is painful. This is hard. God only knows what it's doing for that other being. But I know that for myself, this is, this is absolutely in the way of my, my Buddha nature, my calm mind, my ability to see things clearly and navigate through the world. And in that moment, right, we may even remember the Lojong teaching. Okay, let me in this moment transform this into a virtue. Let me in this moment Ah, oh, this aversion. May myself and everybody experiencing it be free. Whew. And maybe we just say those words and we're still contracted. We're still angry. We're still resentful. We're still blaming. But we're starting to kind of poke into and see through this way that we operate in the world that is so harmful to ourselves and others. It'll be easier for us to identify this with aversion than with our neutrality. I actually was really moved by this neutrality um, example and part of the slogan in our current context. I've read this slogan before, practiced with this slogan. I think again that there's, there's just no space to not care anymore. We just, it's not a possibility. Um, our world depends on the caring for all. Uh, those that are hard to care for, and those that we just don't even remember to care about, those we don't know are suffering. And that's really interesting. It requires something different than that recognition of aversion, right? Kind of easy to notice if you're contracted and angry. How do you notice if you're neutral? How do we investigate that? 
And I think this is why Chandra and I were discussing this weekend about this settling mind, settling the mind in its natural state practice that each of us kind of came to um, together feeling like, wow, this is the right practice for these slogans. We have to train ourselves in the subtlety of mind. So some of you may have noticed as Chandra was beautifully instructing us that the, your mind itself may proliferate with thoughts that have these qualities. Thoughts where you're like, oh yeah, what is my snack after meditation tonight? Oh, I like that thought. Hmm, that's a good one to think of. Maybe it's some um, plant-based cheese or fruit or some nuts, right? Or we have that thought come up of, God, that was a really awkward interaction I had today. Oh, God, that was really unpleasant. Still sticky in its own right. Or maybe they're just, just the, you know, the neutral thoughts coming through of, looks like my window needs cleaning or whatever it is if you're staring out in front of you and so we can see that in order for us to start developing that 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 subtle that refined ability to notice not just the aversion and, the, and not just the craving many of us are familiar with craving but that neutrality we should do so in this practice based setting where that subtlety can really rise up to meet us Chandra, that's what I, what I have for now. Yes, Eve, you've been pointing to this brilliant alchemy of the practice of really integrating these Lojong's teachings into every moment of our life and our feelings and as you were talking about the neutral or the neutrals <laughs> I like that the neutrals uh, I also more recently became fascinated with the neutral people because they make up the vast majority of the population so we have to practice with those feelings or reactions or lack of reactions, this indifference, but then also the word for this kind of the klesha, the, the afflictive emotion that arises in response to this neutral feeling where it's just maybe you could say bland or monotone is marikva, which means uh, ignorance. But ma is negative and to, it, just a negative modifier in Tibetan and then rigpa is it means different things in different contexts but in this context it simply means not knowing rigpa means knowing so ma rigpa means not knowing or forgetting and when when I apply this to social justice for example racial justice this working with neutral people, people we don't know, people who we, we see on the news perhaps or are over there, or really softening the heart and working Tonglen with this neutral category has huge repercussions because it helps to transmute our marikva, our not knowing, our ignorance, our blinders, our unperceived biases, you could say, into clarity and self-knowing and more awareness it's a form of liberation and so this this alchemical genius of the slogans is so palpable in this this slogan and you know we transform the three objects and three poisons namely of aversion attachment and ignorance or indifference into the three roots of virtue by practicing Tonglen in this context that's what the commentaries say that through sending with the out breath receiving with the in breath being willing even if it's just in prayer <laughs> to take on the suffering of others then maybe we could build more capacity to be skillful in other ways through the Tonglen practice this is the alchemy that's how we transmute the three poisons into the three virtues so these three poisons become the, the three seeds of virtue or the three roots of virtue. How? Like a peacock that eats poisonous snakes. So that is what makes the colors of the peacock tail so vibrant is the transmutation of the poison from the snake 
And without it, it wouldn't have that iridescence. So the poison becomes the beauty. The poison also can become the medicine, we can understand in this way. So these are opportunities to open your heart and awaken this relative and ultimate bodhicitta. And we can step out of ego fixation. These three poisons are seeds of becoming uh, free of ego fixation. In other words, a child of illusion. It's open-minded, play. And so what are the seeds of virtue? So instead of the reactive aversion, attachment, and ignorance, those three poisons, we drop the storyline, we feel our heart, we come home with the breath into the heart space, we feel the wound of whatever that reaction is that feels a little poisonous, or dull, or asleep, or numb. We touch that soft spot, that soft spot in that moment of touching it, that is bodhicitta. And that's how the poisons then transform into the virtues. And in this context, they are the loving kindness, metta, compassion, karuna, and equanimity, upeksha. And so what they say in particular is that attachment transmutes or becomes metta, loving-kindness. Aversion becomes compassion, karuna. Ignorance or indifference becomes a warm-hearted equanimity. A warm-hearted equanimity, not meaning a, a disconnected equanimity, a warm-hearted equanimity. Upeksha. So our shamatha, our settling the mind in its natural state, also our insight practice, or vipassana, our tonglen meditation practice, all of these practices are practices where we find this middle ground between acting out and repressing, the middle path. And we discover how to hold our seat and feel completely what's underneath. All of that storyline of wanting, not wanting, numbing out, and so on. So, three objects, three poisons, three seeds of virtue or roots of virtue. So much packed in in that beautiful slogan. So much good dharma, classic dharma. <laughs> So, thank you. So before we get to some of these um, wonderful comments and questions, we're going to do a really brief practice of trying out some of these ideas together. So I invite you to come into, once again, a posture that will really support the qualities of relaxation and ease as well as that upright vividness. And see if there's some sustained resonance from settling the mind earlier. If you can just slip right back into that sense of presence, attending to the space of the mind and noticing whatever arises within it. And gently shifting from this refreshment back into focusing on the space of the mind. We now turn to our imagination. And first, bring to mind 
a treasured and cherished being in your life. Someone who you would delight in seeing right in front of you. And imagine them there, smiling. Notice what it may feel like at just the qualitative embodied level to imagine them here, smiling towards you. Thinking of enjoyment you have shared, how it has felt to be in their presence in the past. And just savoring that sense of really enjoying the presence of this cherished being. And then gently releasing them allowing them to fade back into the space of the mind. I invite you now to consider or bring to mind someone neutral. This can be so hard. So you may be able to think of it more easily as someone unknown or unfamiliar. This could again be someone on this call you've never seen before, just a face. No strong preference towards or against. And now invite them vividly here in front of you. It may be a bit harder to have that image. This could also be someone maybe you saw outside on a socially distanced walk. Someone you saw in the news. Someone who is unfamiliar or unknown. Not a lot of strong feelings about. Invite them here and again notice at this embodied level, this level of our, our valence, pleasant or unpleasant. You'll see that kind of experience in the body inviting this person here. much as possible, just focusing on their presence here in front of you and what it feels like in the body and mind to hold this person here in front of you. And gently releasing the image of this person, letting it fade back for now. And then we can turn our mind towards now someone who we experience as challenging or difficult. I invite you to choose someone maybe who's not the hardest person, but someone where there is struggle. Maybe you know this person well, maybe this is someone you have read about or see in the news. Someone for whom there is that palpable sense of aversion. And once again, though there may be some resistance to do so, <clears throat> invite this person here as though they were right in front of you. Again, noticing, attending closely to what is the impact on the mind and the body. And then with relief, releasing them, letting them fade back into the space of the mind. And just taking a couple cleansing breaths here, bringing our attention back into the body. As much as possible, releasing the residue of those cherished, neutral, and difficult persons we've brought in.
And then shifting once again, back to that cherished person, inviting them back right in front. Their smiling, beaming face and presence. And consider for a moment this person who is so dear to you. Is it possible that in some ways, in some realm of possibility, they could become less cherished, maybe distant? Maybe you lose touch or move away. Maybe your lives diverge. Is it possible this cherished person could at some point in the future become actually neutral. And painful they, though it may be to consider, is it within the realm of possibility this person could actually become someone difficult or challenging? Maybe there's a misunderstanding. Maybe there's an incident or event that's hard to recover from. without malice or harm, just opening to the possibility that this cherished person could at one point become either neutral or maybe considered challenging or difficult. Noticing again, what is that like to experience at an embodied level and in the mind? <clears throat> And with the next exhale, release the image of this person, release these ideas and imaginings. And return to the breath. Fully following an inhale and exhale. And then returning again to this neutral person inviting them back vividly in front of you. And opening up to the reality that this person, just like you, has joys and pains. That it could be possible that life could intervene and bring you together. That this person could become a cherished person. Someone whose well-being matters is of utmost importance. Without knowing the details of this person's life, see if it's possible to cultivate this kind of care and compassion as you would for someone you cared about deeply. Imagine sharing enjoyable times with them knowing their life challenges, knowing their wonderful attributes and qualities. Rejoicing in that. And then, once again, through the exhale, releasing the image and ideas, imaginings of this being. And returning to follow the breath. Cleansing the palate of heart and mind by attending to the breath through inhale and exhale. And then once again, returning and bringing forth as though in front of you vividly, this more challenging or difficult person. And though it may seem so far from current reality, is it possible that in time this person could become neutral, no longer painful or offensive,
that the harm caused could be lessened. Then maybe this person could start to become a being for whom you had no strong feelings whatsoever. Is it even possible that this could become a being for whom you felt care? A being included in your sphere of compassion and concern, just as you would for a cherished beloved. This may be hard to imagine, but consider the possibility. Imagine holding this person within your sphere of care. Notice the resistance or possible openness to this. Notice how it impacts the body and mind to even conceive of and consider this possibility. And again, with your next exhale, release this person and these imaginings and come back for the breath. Following the breath while noticing still what shifts or changes may have been going on in the body and what is here now. I want to thank the Venerable Tenzin Chioki, who some of you have met or know well. She shared that practice with me. It was uh, such a painful experience for me the first time to imagine this beloved person, either neutral or difficult, but I felt it to be such a powerful teaching tool of how our preferences cut us off. Um, yeah, we'd, we'd love to hear from you all, either reflections on that practice or on this work altogether. I heard from Walt here in the, in the chat that I agree that there's no room in today's world for not caring, but there are those who react to the stress by shutting down and caring only about themselves. It's every man for himself. Yeah, it is a real big hazard of our time. And it actually takes training to keep open, right? As we all know, it, the shutting down can be such a helpful intermediary. Um, yeah, any thoughts or reflections from that practice? In the chat or by unmuting. I see Claudia's hand. Oh, it says the Zoom doesn't allow unmute. Will the benevolent hands of Pamela and Mace please? It should them... now if you try. Works. Okay. <laughs> Jean Francois, would you like? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, one one thing I observe when doing those practices of compassion and, and uh, loving kindness uh, towards uh, the so-called enemy is that um, my initial natural reaction to those type of encounters is uh, cutting off, as you were, or shutting off, as you were saying. So as I do those practices, I actually feel even more aversion initially than I used to. Uh, and it requires even more skillfulness and mindfulness than just like 
being, uh, you know, cutting myself off. So is that a good sign or is that a sign of progress? Or <laughs> so you say more aversion, just so I understand, uh, more aversion than if you saw them in person or more aversion than if you just kind of brought them to mind? Like uh, last weekend, I went in, in, in the campground. There were some difficult people around. For instance, normally I would just like not care. I was doing it. Ha I was happening to do a lot of those practices, and I felt even much more stuff welling up uh, than usual. Uh, and I, I, I'm sure it was related with the practices. So I'm a little curious about that happening. Gosh, yeah, Chandra, I'd be so curious what what you would have to say with that. Oh, can she also? Oh, there you go. You can answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Both good, I know. You know it all go a little. That's a tough one. Yeah. I do find I also get I am more sensitive sometimes because of my practice. Or is it that I'm just more aware of what's going on? It's, it's Sometimes it's not clear. More room, more kind of opportunity to, to, to work at a higher level, Jean-Francois. <laughs> yeah. Uh, don't lose courage there with that one. They, yeah. they say that the deeper we go with the practice, the more challenging. It, it can often get, seem like we're not getting anywhere, that things are getting worse, but it's actually showing us uh, the, the rawness beneath the hardened surface. And it, it's a good sign through our practice that things actually do seem to get more challenging. Yes, Eve. Go ahead. Yeah, that, that's my, that's also my um, orientation is that it's bringing to the surface more that needs to be seen. Um, this is also a practice you can do with a loved one. You know, when you love them and they're showing up and doing the things you want them to do, when they're just kind of like out of your sphere of concern, you're not even thinking about them. And when they do those things that make you really dislike them, right? So we can see, you know, we're kind of poking into here um, that our preferences, actually, they are, they are kind of shifting and mutable. Um, and so there was a great um, question here from Eli, kind of as a follow-up, where he says, um, how can you transform the difficult person without feeling like you're sacrificing your values? Um, and we can still, and this is such an, an awesome and always important aspect of um, how do we hold accountability for someone who is harmful and still hold compassion for them? And I think it's, 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 uh, it doesn't mean that we um, kind of just lay ourselves down and let them walk over us. Uh, what Pema Chodron calls doormat compassion, the doormat compassion, just, okay, oh gosh, oh, sure, just walk over me and things must be hard for you. And maybe you're so rude and mean because you had a hard life, right? No, none of that. Um, but we can see or, or recognize that our aversion towards them gets in the way of our true compassion period and of our training. And so it's not that you're, um, you know, let's say you brought up a political figure who's causing a great deal of harm, don't know who we could be thinking of, and you are holding them in compassion. It doesn't mean you go to the ballot box and vote for them, right? So there's a way of um, acting in compassion without surrendering one's values. Looking here at the chat, um, Claudia says, realizing that there is no fixed self, impermanence allows for changes and opening to the possibility of change and broadening our horizon, giving people the chance to grow. Yeah, that's exactly right. And Walt says, imagine being black in a campground. That's why I avoid them. Yes, it's... Um, I think ideally we would bring our practice everywhere, but if there is ways that we can reduce harm to ourself by not being in circumstances that are too challenging, my gosh, let us do so. Other questions or reflections on that practice? We have one minute, plenty of time. I don't know if you do have time, but I am curious what distinguishes indifference from equanimity? 
they feel very similar to me. It's almost like indifference is like skillful, or sorry, equanimity is like skillful indifference, but I don't think that's true. <laughs> so I'm just curious. I feel like the, the screen focuses on me, even if I just smile. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I keep seeing it with the yellow screen, the yellow light around me, and I'm just smiling. You have a very big smile. <laughs> oh, yes, that's a good question. the The word uh, the word is thangyom thangyom in Tibetan, and it for equanimity. And it's it is a warm indifference. No I'm kidding. Um, it is a warm feeling of evenness, and one way to talk about it is one taste meaning that not the whole world tastes the same. It's not like a platter of wonderful food all tastes like one thing, but rather we have an kind of an even keeled or equanimous experience in relationship to reality that is has this quality in Dzogchen we, and Mahamudra, we talk of one taste. Mm -hmm. So that we're not always pulled by the winds of we want, we don't want, we don't, but we find that we're there, we're present, and one of the greatest examples of, I know we're at time, so I'll keep this short, but one of the greatest examples of real life practice of equanimity was in my early days of studying Dharma at a, at a retreat, at a Dharma center down in LA. And there were a few resident monks who were fr really just right from Tibet, Amdo, Eastern Tibet, barely any English. And I was helping to cook and uh, would take the teachings and just assist and be a part of the community there. And sometimes I'd say, would you like this? Or how is that? Or would you like to go over there? And Lama Chunam would always say, not good, not bad. <laughs> Do you like this? Do you not like this? Are you okay? Uh, not good, not bad. Not good, not bad. So it's that quality of contentment and presence and compassion, but not being pulled around uh, by circumstances. I hope that's helpful. Eve? Yeah, you know, I think it's um, within indifference, I think there is, there's like this, you know, I, I appreciate that there's sometimes this um, synonym of ignorance because it's a, it's a not knowing. Equanimity seems like the exact opposite. It's the all knowing of impermanence and interdependence and from there having the space. Yeah. Um, we are two minutes over, but I see a hand from Donna. Is it, is it a quick one, maybe? We'd love to hear from you. I don't have a question, but you know, it was, I was thinking about how um, aversion is such a strong feeling mm. um, that, that it really requires uh, a process of unpacking mm. move of someone and transform it into neutrality or empathy just feels like that's a long arc <laughs> um so i don't know at some point um and you, you both of you have probably discussed this before but the process of transforming aversion to that mm. Do you do that? <laughs> How do you do that? Yeah, you know, I, I think you're right. It's long, right? And that especially if there is um, a being who we find um, a constant place of rumination and kind of perseverating upon them, it's, it might be our natural opportunity to do so, not just in practice, but throughout the day. Um, and I think, you know, we, we think, I, I loved you, the example of heartbreak because it's such an intense emotional experience where we have such an ongoing rumination. Um, and that can also happen when we're frustrated at someone, we're angry at them. It, it might be the same in our heartbreak. We might have a lot of anger and we get to work with it just slowly, slowly, you know, almost like the, um, you know, think of the raindrop slowly smoothing the stone. <clears throat> but we really are just like encasing and encompassing with that compassion. Um, and, and of course, you know, um, as I think 
was uh, described last week has to begin with ourselves. Um, or maybe it's next week. Um, it's just so essential. Oh, the full moon just greeted me through the window. So it greets you all. How wonderful. Um, and so I think it's, yeah, it's, it's a really slow process. And, and yet, um, you know, I, in reading Beyond Religion um, with you all, I got such a clear instruction that compassion and forgiveness are the same. And I think my experience of forgiveness has been that you can try and you can try and you can try, but then sometimes it just naturally arises. So that we are doing it, again, without hope of fruition, practicing this compassion, hoping to let go of this aversion, and we may find that the fruits of it emerge when we're not really trying or efforting. So I, I hope that's helpful. Yeah. Wonderful to be with you all, as always. Wednesday nights are such a highlight and I just love our community and our conversation and being in this practice together. So let's go ahead and dedicate the merit of this practice. So once again, coming into this space of reflecting inwardly and considering what we have shared here together this evening and the settling of our mind this exploration into the practice, the radical practice of transforming the poisons into virtues and dedicating any benefit of these teachings, this discussion, this embodied direct experience to the benefit of all beings so that all beings would feel safe and at ease all beings would know compassion. All beings would be healthy and strong. All beings would be included and include all others in their sphere of concern. Thanks all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Eve. Thank you, Pamela and Mace and everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank, you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. See you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.